So now I want to transition to another topic within the paper that I thought was fascinating. And I'm curious to hear each of you dive into the nuances here. And that is the concept of fat loading. So I mentioned this in the outline. I've literally have never heard of anyone within the natural bodybuilding community discuss fat loading. I mean, whenever it comes to peak week, the, the main concern is basically sodium, water, and carbohydrates, right? If somebody comes on stage and they're flat, they're like, oh, like maybe I, I just didn't have enough carbs or, or maybe I should have had more water. And as you guys have mentioned a couple times here, what, when you're carb loading, you need to make sure that there's enough water, there's enough sodium, there's enough potassium in order to get that look right. But when I'm reading this section on fat loading and these recommendations that are within there as an option and how carb loading itself can decrease intramuscular triglycerides. I'm looking at this and I'm like, I don't know how many people are out there who didn't peak right on show day. And they're like, just didn't get enough carbs, man, or, or like whatever. And it's like, did you not consume enough fat? So, so this is something I, I'm very keen to dive into. Uh, Dr. Escalante, why don't you start us off here with just the mechanistic rationale for fat load for fat loading, how that could enhance a person's physique. And, and I know we're coming up on time for you. So when, whenever you need to dip out, just, just let me know. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, no, I think uh, what, one of the big mechanism and actually um, as we wrote in the paper, you know, this has actually been around in, in the, in, at least in the enhanced community for a while. I, I, I remember asking the same question in 2006 for the North American championships. I was working with a coach back then and uh, he actually said, you know, we're going to fat load you. And, and, you know, and here I'm very smart and I'm thinking, what is the physiological mechanism for fat loading? Like, I don't understand. So I, that's when I kind of first started, you know, kind of digging in into, into some of the research. And, and this is, uh, uh, and actually Scott's going to expand it because this is actually his little baby that he actually uh, uh, authored a lot. Uh, but uh, what uh, the, the main mechanism here is really that, you know, we, we have our, our body stores, our muscle cells are going to store both fat and glycogen. Uh, and so we have both stores available uh, and it's, it's just the way that it stores energy. Uh, so we often focus on the glycogen uh, component, but realistically, uh, the the IM the IMT uh, component where the where the triglycerides are stored, uh, that's that can actually be about one percent of the of the muscle. Uh, and when we actually did the math uh, per se for uh, say a, a a bodybuilder that's uh, that's carrying around sixty kilograms of of uh, fat free mass, um, you can actually see that. In a, in a super compensated state, that could actually translate to roughly uh, about 0.6 kilograms. So over over one and a, over 1.2 pounds of of actual uh, um, I can't we can't say muscle right because it's not muscle, but it's gonna it's gonna be muscle that's actually uh, now a little bit bigger uh, and it, that's gonna be distributed throughout the body. And I don't know about you guys, but for us, I mean, an extra pound of muscle. I mean, we work hard for a pound of muscle. Uh, so that's fantastic. But I'll go ahead and let Scott kind of uh, talk about it and, and uh, go, go into behind the mechanism of, uh, of how it works and, uh, and, uh, and, and why we would think about uh, implementing it. I'll go so far to say it, it is muscle. Like it's, it's just one of the, I mean, you can look at, break down the body in various, you know, you can, you can use a fat-free mass and body fat compartmentalization. You can do a chemical analysis. And if you look at the, the tissue that is muscle and specific skeletal muscle, that's composed of those cells. It's actually composed of the nerves that are there, the connective, like uh, every muscle is actually an organ in and of itself. So it's made of muscle tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, and nervous tissue. Those are the four tissue types. And in the muscle cell, that's fat is there. So if it's bigger, that's what we want. Like, so it literally is part of muscle. And yeah, so it's really, it's really fascinating. If you, if you look at the rodent studies, at least there's not as much out there with humans, but there's a wide variability in the relative percentage of uh, the, or volume of the muscle cell that's occupied by intramuscular triglycerides stored there. And if you look at like, even as far back as like some of Per Tesh's original stuff, looking at glycogen use and IMT and muscular triglyceride use, it can be a substantial, there can be a substantial loss in storage of triglyceride inside the cells from resistance exercise. So 
uh, and you can get this, a somewhat of a kind of a, you get a super compensatory effect, at least to some degree, as best we can tell. What you don't get, of course, is that osmotic effect. Um, the glycogen glycogenic complex, you know, is, is hydrophilic, so it pulls water to it, but you don't have that fat and water don't mix. So you're not pulling water when you store that fat, but still a pound of muscle mass is a pound of muscle mass. So if we have a scenario, let's, let's say, for instance, someone's taken a very like low, low fat approach to their dietary strategy. So it's protein and carbs, and that's what works for them. And, and just the fact simply that if you're doing a lot of training, especially, especially if it's high volume training and you're in a caloric deficit, it's possible. It would make sense that your, your fat stores inside the muscle cells are going to be lowered or going to be reduced. So keeping those full or filling those back up at least makes sense just to optimize the volume of the muscle cells and therefore the size and fullness of the muscle on stage. But there's also that really kind of fascinating phenomenon you mentioned, Mike, in that there seems to be, as best I can sort of like tease out, there seems to be something going on whereby the energy process of actually storing, taking glucose that's been brought in the cell, transported in, and storing that in its branched pattern along with the glycogen and protein, there's a little ATP that's actually used and lost in that process. And there's an energy demand that comes from that, which it seems like at least looking at the animal work is during the process of glycogen um, storage, there's actually some intramuscular triglyceride that gets used up in that process as if it's a relatively slow one. When I talk about a high energy demand, we just know generally from muscle bioenergetics that low energy demand things like sitting still, especially if your diet, dietary intake is low in carbohydrate, you use lots more fats versus more glycogen. So that process of even if you've loaded glycogen, you're loading glycogen and storing more glycogen, it could end up because it's a, you're sitting still when this is happening, it's low energy demand. It makes sense that you would use some of those fats that are stored in there for that process. So it seems like you can actually go run low on storage of triglycerides in the muscle cell during the process of carving up. So this is, I just explained this, um, maybe it's to a client. I've got a client doing a practice run right now. And, uh, or I can't remember where it was, I, you know, I have so many conversations that all kind of blur together in the, in the storm of private messages and direct messages. But uh, the idea that of, of holding a carb load is one that's been put out there with adding fats in to some degree. So it makes sense, of course, if you carved up um, that you don't want to do a bunch of activity and then reduce those carbohydrates by posing excessively or training again or what have you. But you also want to have some um, fat. So you'd replace that with fat. If your day before the show is geared at trying to drop water as in the protocol of the show, but this idea of holding the load with the idea that you see sometimes people carving up and then slowly transitioning from higher carb meals to higher fat meals. That makes sense. If there is sort of some loss of intramuscular triglyceride that comes during the carb up. So you want more fat in there as you transition from higher carb to lower carb meals because now you're replacing that fat and you're volumizing the cell in doing so. And because you're doing that, you're, you're ensuring it. This is total armchair speculation here, but who knows, there may be even to some degree um, a limiting or breaking force on the rate at which you can glyc store glycogen if the muscle triglyceride were to be too low. Let's say that the way the energy is, is uh, derived for the process, I'm just, just pure speculation, but this is what podcasts are for, right? Yeah. Just get out there. So if, if indeed there's some impact that having low or critically low intramuscular triglyceride could have on the rate at which you can store glycogen, then you want to start off your glycogen load with some triglyceride in place. And maybe you'd want to at least have some of that along the way, maybe at the end, to just to make sure that you're not running critically low after you've been carving up rapidly with very low fat to make sure that you, you don't run into a low uh, triglyceride levels when you're really trying to maximally fill and supercompensate your glycogen levels. So we have in the protocol sort of during that period where you're, you're reducing glycogen somewhat with the training, not trying to necessarily deplete. That might be a question we get to. You don't have to like drop down to rock bottom in order to get a super compensatory effect, but have fats in there. So you have calories. So you're not like burning up muscle because you're in just a protein only type of scenario for several days but you also could potentially fat load. So if you've got someone who's doing high volume and um, low fat dieting, they could actually literally have one of those beautiful scenarios, which you can hear applied to the glycogen storage situation, whereby they're taking in, let's say 
um, a eucaloric, a calorically balanced diet that's protein and fat primarily, but actually losing body fat overall because a good number of those, the, those fat calories taken in are going and being stored, but you still have a, 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 a caloric expenditure requirement because of what you're doing in the training, whereby you're actually driving fat from the body fat stores and some of the fat that you're consuming or maybe the body fat stores too are being recycled and then stored in those muscle cells that are low in fat. So you can have like this beautiful, like almost holy grail type of phenomenon where you're losing fat while you're eating fat and loading in fat in the muscle cell. Again, you know, wild ass speculation, but it's fun. And then you, you're set up. So you've got plenty of fat around so you don't run critically low during your carb up. And then when you start adding the fats through the end of your carb up, perhaps, um, in the day before, when you're trying to then drop water and having low carbohydrate, it helps with that. You've got those fats there to quote, hold the load. And of course, make sure you don't drop into a, a caloric deficit. That's just terrible. And maybe even for some people fat load that, that day, just before the show, you didn't intentionally try to fat load earlier, but if there is some room for filling up beyond which, what you got with the glycogen and the associated water, you can fat load them the day before. Um, which is, is nice because you get to eat yummy stuff. A lot of times fatty foods taste good. That's going to keep your stress low. That's going to make that day enjoyable. And you're actually improving your physique because you're getting that extra pound or so if you're a big bodybuilder by doing the fat loading. So, um, and I can imagine too, even if someone doesn't intentionally try to like just blast the fats, sometimes the fat loading, you look at the protocols, you're like, oh, wow, like that looks delicious, but I can't, that seems a little extreme. But even then, you know, you may be, if someone is really devoid and low on intramuscular glycogen, you may just get some filling there that's generally helpful, even if you haven't pushed it. So like the dynamics of the fat loading are like, you, you hadn't even heard of them before. Guys have been doing it for quite some time, but it's something that um, I'll mention uh, um, uh, Jason, um, what's Jason's last name? He goes by Scooby Snacks. Um, Theobald, Jason Theobald, he's a, he's a coach, been around for a while. He's an IFB pro classic physique. He's been doing, he does fat loading. He's just one person who pops to mind. So of course people who do ketogenic diets, they kind of play around with this all the time. Um, so there's some other people who, who have played around with fats. There's a couple people who's, who are really big on the fats and I can't vouch for all their ideas, but Jason Theobald's a coach who does this a good bit. So that's sort of the idea. And it's just one thing. It's nice you plant that seed of, you know, potential thought. And like, I would love for someone then that just literally, you could just do an experiment where you just have people literally devoid, eat a, a diet devoid of fat and find that you can deplete fat dietarily and through exercise and then see what kind of super compensatory effect do we get? And does that show up with an ultrasound muscle thickness measurement or an MRI or a CT cross-sectional measurement or, you know, a biopsy or what have you? Um, so that would be the interesting, you know, things just, to, just to evaluate. So that's why, why we put, want to put it in there. And plus just for the sake of being complete, you know, because it is something that it's, uh, it's lesser known, but I think it can help people for the reasons I, uh, I just, I just threw out there into the wind for the, for the sake of come, making it a, a fun topic to talk about. You might yeah, have, I, I do want to highlight, you know, that in the paper, we actually did say that this is something that it's been done in the trenches for a long time, but it's something that has not been explored. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of room for, uh, for research in this that I think would be, would, uh, would be neat to look at as kind of Scott alluded to here is, you know, looking at, you know, Hey, if we measure with, with ultrasound, do we actually like, like some of the study that they've done with the, with the uh, uh, carb loading. So we can actually look, it's like, Hey, this, does the muscle volume actually indeed increase uh, you know, with, with this protocol, or maybe even combining the protocol with the glycogen loading, um, you know, proceeded with the fat loading. And the way we wrote it in the protocol, as Scott said, is uh, it, it, it works out nicely because while you're carb depleting, you can actually fat load at the same time. Uh, and then now that set you, sets you up for maybe potentially more efficient carbohydrate loading. Um, and then now you can really, now you've super compensated kind of both components mm -hmm. there. And then that last day before the show, uh, the nice thing about fat loading too, is the chances of you spilling over as you can with carbs are, are minimized. So you, you don't, you don't have that component there. So now you can continue to potentially fill the muscle. Um, and I mean, unless you're eating, you know, uh, 20,000 calories worth of fat, which hopefully then, then, then that might actually backfire. Right. But if you're, you're consuming, you know, at within uh, a caloric, uh, within your calories for your, for your caloric expenditure, 
uh, you're going to be fine. You're not going to store it as, as body fat. If anything, you're going to store it in that uh, in the intramyocellular uh, triglycerides, which is great. Dr. G, that was my exact question that I was going to follow with. So you, you have this outline of a potential strategy for competitors in the paper, and there's this potential for a beautiful marriage, right? So you carb deplete, and then you're also fat loading at the same time. So these things work well uh, in synchrony with one another. But then as Dr. Stevenson was talking, you know, what came to my mind was that, well, instead of separating these processes and fat loading and then carb loading and pulling fats down to a minimum and then potentially fat loading again, like why not just do your carb load, but also bump up your fats coinciding with that? Like, is there some mechanism there that would suggest that might be an inferior strategy to spacing these out? For me, or- yeah, go ahead, Scott. Anyone take it. Um, well, one, one thing you can run into is, and this is some of this is just thinking about this kind of practically, is that let's say you've got an individual who needs 2,000 grams of carbs. You know, they're pretty big. They need, they need that to kind of fill out their glycogen. So they're going to do like a couple, maybe 1,500 grams, a lot of food. And they've got, you know, X amount of time to do that. And let's say they would meet another, um, you know, 1,000 calories worth. It's actually the calorie equivalent that we sort of speculated was roughly equivalent. So it, it might be, you know, 500 grams of, of fat, something like that. Um, could be a large amount. Literally, we're talking about the same number of calories potentially. So if you're trying to do that in two days, you've got to have someone who's been dieting down and probably has a very small stomach and a small ability to take in that much food. You're asking for bloat city. You're asking for problems <laughs> trying to do all that at once. It's possible too that um, at least in terms of like, especially a situation where you want to have rapid glycogen uh, storage, someone's, you know, trying to weigh in, let's say, if you can get the food down, this is one way to do it. But when you've got that fat, it's going to tend to slow the absorption of glucose, lower the glycemic index, means less insulin potentially. It's going to slow the glycogen loading process potentially. So that's kind of an issue there. Um, so there's some practical issues with that, but I think maybe the question that is sort of the next next one in line here is the idea of a shitload in the morning yeah. of a show and what have you, right? Yeah. So those two things can happen simultaneously. So the, the question is, one meal can seem like it can make a, a bit of a difference. And here's the thing, and I'm, I'm not gonna contradict myself necessarily, but if you look at, for instance, insulin index uh, tables, and you look at the foods that, produce the greatest insulin response i think one of the highest ones there is ice cream okay because it's got fat and carbs in it's delicious it's sweet it's fatty it's yummy so you can get a great insulin response because some of that is is cephalic some of it's psychological so if you if you want to if you want to rapidly replenish glycogen and maybe get a fat loading effect at the same time you can get a um a insulin release from the body itself with those yummy fatty foods. A burger is like, who doesn't want a burger when you've been dieting for X number of weeks and you haven't had burgers for you know three months. So I think you can get a good, at least acute and sort of rapid response. That's why people tend to do this. Um, you run into issues, of course, if you're taking in sodium and you haven't uh, completely dried out, that's all, the whole dehydration issue is another one. We can talk about the circumstances where that kind of a shit loading thing would make sense. So you could, I mean, one, one, a strategy someone could use is try to have a prolonged period whereby they simply take in mixed macronutrient meals. So instead of starting on Sunday or Monday with a low carb period to insulin sensitize and prepare for the glycogen loading, they could try and like go to a mixed macronutrient meal strategy, which would, might be different than what they've been using, maybe just increasing their calories and slowly eat up into the show. And, and that can work for sure. Um, so that's one that is, I see used less often. Um, hypothetically, it makes sense, but you're sort of stabbing a little more at the dark, I think, in terms of what we know as far as what's worked, like for glycogen loading in particular, um, like the original sort of uh, Bergstrom and Holtman studies where they use themselves as, as subjects and they depleted their glycogen down to like nothing, which t- had been just totally brutal. And then they just layered in the carbs. That can be, you can achieve similar glycogen levels um, with a more modest approach, 
and uh, and tapering your training as well. Bill Sherman at Ohio State at the time did that like in 1980 and found like basically the same. And we we referenced this this paper in the in our article. Same this, saw the same levels with a much more modest, less risk of overtraining type of phenomenon strategy. So we've kind of mirrored that with our peak week, where you're basically in, insulin sensitizing, setting up for the carb load, and then making sure you have plenty of glycate or plenty of carbs coming in. Um, some people have to eat so many carbs if you're doing it sort of in a two day period like that, that adding fat just would make it almost impossible for them. You can spread it out to three days and that might work for some people. That might be, you know, rather than someone like there are carbs that are going to work better for some people than others. There's, there's a study I talk about one of my, I'm um, going to go off a little, little bit tangent here, but it's a study comparing white bread and glucose in terms of the glycemic responses. And on one whole page of the study, they show like 16 or 20 individual glucose responses to a hundred gram load of those two carbohydrate sources. And none of the relative patterns of increasing blood glucose matches for any of those subjects. <laughs> for some, one's higher than the other. Some of them have perfect curves from start to finish. Sometimes the curve kind of goes up an hour into it. The other way around, they're, sometimes they crisscross. It's, it's all over the place. And this is why you hear that some guys do better with just rice and they stick with their sweet potatoes even. And some guys are like, no, I got to get dirty. You know, I got to go with something, you know, that's a little more tasty than that. It varies tremendously. So, and I think there's, there's reasons it probably has to do with oh, various aspects in the, in the insulin sensitive tissues and probably the microbiome as well. Yeah. So you've got this situation where if you start adding those foods and um, actually I've got as for this client, for example, one thing I tend to do, um, he was asking about a shitload. What if that seems, he, cause he wants to try it. We're doing a practice run. So, you know, McDonald's is used so often because McDonald's is everywhere, right? It's ubiquitous. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, there's probably more McDonald's. I'm going to say something that's going to, there's probably more McDonald's than there are COVID back, you know, viruses around the world. <laughs> They're everywhere. It's the original <laughs> pandemic, right? You can, find a, you can find a McDonald's any place. So it's a safe bet pretty much for most people that just map the McDonald's they can get, you know, an egg muffin or what have you for a, a morning shitload where you've got fat, carbohydrate, and some sodium all there at once. And you can do that with a standard kind of American style pancakes and hash browns and eggs meal. But for him, a safer way to do that is to get those components. He's been eating salmon during his prep. He's been eating rice during his prep. Um, he likes yum yum sauce. So we're going to add some of that because it tastes good. And like, who doesn't like yum yum sauce? <laughs> um, so we're going to add the foods that have fats and sodium and carbohydrates that he's been eating and his GI is uh, familiar with already in the event that, a, that at least in this practice run, that that shitload makes sense. So if someone would want to like combine, if they've got a diet where they're using a, a nutrient timing approach or they're, they've been burying their carbohydrates, so if they have high fat meals and, and low fat meals, and they wanted to kind of combine those foods and try what you're talking about, that should work. That should probably, that would probably work. Um, <clears throat> They might, it might, they might feel really good doing that. It, I think what happens sometimes people, when they go from like no carbs to just a ton of carbs, they feel really bad. This is not, not a good feeling. So this might be a more sort of psychologically and even for gut health, a more healthy, for, healthy way to go about this is just, you know, combine the foods you've been eating, get some carbs in, get the fat in there and just eat more for three or four days and then drop your water before the show as needed. So yeah, that's totally viable. There's, so there's a whole another avenue, you know, that's another branch of a study that you could do another, another group where like literally thinking of one right now, you have the no carbs, then add the carbs. And then you have another group that basically does the same kind of thing, keep training all the other variables the same. And they just combine the carbs and the fat simultaneously. What happens there? Is there an advantage in terms of levels of carbohydrate glycogen or muscle triglyceride? If you do sort of more, standardized depletion phase, loading phase, even if the, the training isn't designed to like completely avoid the cells of glycogen, or does it matter? Can you just do the training and have a mixed diet through the entire time and end up with the same glycogen and intramuscular triglyceride levels? Maybe it doesn't matter. That would be less stressful, I think, overall. So yeah, that's a great, that's a big question that's, that's out there. So that's a good, a good insight, Mike, to have thought of that, that question. Yeah, um, Mike, and I'm going to just uh, chime in uh, one more thing before I have to get going, but I just wanted to, uh, in relation to what Scott is saying, he, he hits on, on something that uh, we did highlight in the paper, uh, and that was the, you know, uh, 
probably trying to eat foods that you're used to, uh, you know, to, to the best of your ability. So, you know, introducing a lot of new stuff, if you haven't been able to, to try that out before, uh, that may be a recipe for disaster uh, because you, you might not tolerate it well. And uh, then, then you're, you're going to just shoot yourself in the foot. So uh, that, that peak week strategy can be practiced and you can maybe implement some of these foods and then you know what's going to agree with you. Uh, but I think that one of the, to be safe, I think a, a safe strategy to use is not to do anything drastically different in that peak week, because that's when you can potentially really uh, have some problems. Yeah. So basically when I asked that question about combining both, I, I had this specific intention in mind. I'm thinking, how does this apply to me next time I run through contest prep? Like mm -hmm. how, how would I like to use these strategies? And what popped in my mind is that it, I think I think one of the main benefits of utilizing refeeds at this point, considering the emerging data, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really seem like there's anything physiological going on, at least nothing significant, but it seems that adherence is, is probably a big one, right? Just, just being able to have some higher, higher calorie days and that benefiting sticking to the contest prep diet. But then on top of that, I think a huge benefit is just getting a feel for how you respond to higher calories, to higher carbohydrate intakes, and how that might inform you for your eventual peak week if you decide to go that route. So, mm. so when I'm seeing this data on, you know, combine these strategies and loading carbs and loading fats, and yes, maybe doing these separately might be the best approach, but I'm like, well, maybe if I can do these on the same day, I can use my refeeds when I'm like, you know, six weeks out, 10 weeks out, and kind of fuss around with the ratios to kind of see like which proportion of carbohydrates and fat increasing them both kind of kind of fills me out the best right yeah i mean so there's got so much to say on that one one thing is like my perspective on this and it, it, my origin point so to speak was long ago playing around with cyclical ketogenic diets sort of the standardized like you know five days like a body opus danish chain body opus type of thing and that's a sort of a standard protocol that a lot of people do. It just matches the seven day work week. <clears throat> so in that you'd have a short carb up. So that's why you kept the fats low. So you could just get the carbs in and they tasted great. And there's plenty of great stuff to eat that way. Um, but I think one of the reasons why people might shy away from kind of that approach you're talking about is, and, and this is, this is something that the dynamics of fat storage inside the cell, I don't know that they've been explored to this degree, is that if you are in a caloric surplus or you're eating and you, you look at the overfeeding studies in general, you find that, you know, pretty much, I would, I want to say impossible, but in, for a large extent, eating protein is not going to, excess of protein is not going to produce body fat gains. And same thing, you know, de novo lipogenesis, you're not going to get that from carbohydrate necessarily. At least you can eat, overeat carbs for many days and not have a problem. Whereas if you're in a caloric excess, those fats are going to be more likely to be stored as body fat. Those are going to end up in the fat cells. So that's sort of the risk. That's the risk you're playing. That's the gamble you've got in doing this. Now, the week before a show, it's not going to matter. You know, presuming you're in the situation where you you suspect because you dieted so hard and your training volume was there that you are low in intramuscular triglyceride and glycogen, so you're really depleted and on both accounts, then loading both makes perfect sense. Of course, when you're dieting down and you're doing refeeds, just like in that period, generally speaking, of course, it really comes down to calories in, calories out over the long haul. But you've got a situation where, you know, you might, if you're eating uh, 4,000 calories and let's say just because there is, again, it's, it's going to end up being a caloric balance over the long haul, but uh, you know, you have to, you have to come up, come up with a way to balance this in some way that might be just guesswork, but imagine the situation where you take in 4,000 calories on those re on the refeed day. And the fat that you take in is so high that the rate of intake of fat exceeds the rate at which you can deposit that in the skeletal muscle cells. So on that day, you basically, you know, you get glycogen is doing okay. You're storing a lot of that refilling plus some of that glycogen goes to, um, <clears throat> just meeting your caloric needs for the day, but some of that fat kind of ends up in, um, in body fat. Oh, yeah. This is sort of a minor point and it's not trying to violate the, the laws of thermodynamics, yeah, yeah. but you just have to make sure that if you, if you did, let's say not refeed, maybe you took in 400 grams of fat 
let's say, or not that many, wouldn't that many, let's say 200 grams of fat or 100 grams of fat. And it should have 50 was the max, was all you needed to really top off those intramuscular fat cells, fat stores. Then that excess of fat is going to go someplace and it, some of it will be oxidized, but you're going to tend to oxidize more carbs, especially if you've got more carbs coming in. So you've got, you know, any surplus for that day is going to be directed towards body fat more so than the scenario if you're just eating protein and carbs. So you just have to make sure that your caloric deficit on all those, on all those other days is going to be low enough. And for that to be profitable, you'd have to like maybe do it for two days in a row or do it long enough or be lean enough to see that adding the fats does have an additional benefit in terms of your filling out and the way you want to look on stage. So it could certainly be done. And I'm not saying like, you know, that's a thing you could, you could literally imagine you've got 16 weeks of dieting, you get to that eight week point and you have a refeed of 24 hours that you do one week, you do standardize it to 4,000 calories. And, you know, you've got your protein set at a gram per pound or even less because you got a excess of calories on those days. And you just take a higher ratio of fat with so, so much carbs and then try to flip flop those the next week. So go back and forth. And as you diet down, you sort of, you know, sort of toggle between the higher fat or maybe half and half, and then a higher carb and lower fat, whatever strategies you want to try. And you can just see, it's like, you know what, on every other week when I'm going with fat, fats in with the carbs, only 500 grams instead of 800 grams of carbs, I fill out just as I fill out better. I feel better. My, my hunger, I don't have the ghrelin response that you get from a lot of high carb meals that just drop, like I just want to eat all day the next day. So maybe there's a satiating effect that happens that, that is beneficial to getting back on your diet the next day psychological effect because you got to eat like use some really good food some show up on instagram type of foods you know <laughs> burgers or what have you so there could be so that's the way i think you could you could play with that and then you find you know what i'm three weeks out i'm really good shape i'm going to do a practice run and i'm going to try use, using these more mixed fat and carbs with enough protein to make sense days and try doing three days of that see what happens if it works well then you got to, you know, give it a go for your first show, you know, and then you could try just the carbs the next time if you want. So you could, could definitely do that. So I like that idea a lot, especially, especially if the benefits are such that it helps, like you said, with dietary adherence and appetite and, um, you know, heck, like just being able to go out and gosh, I remember, here's a funny story. So you, a couple of years ago, I was in Colorado, um, and did a seminar with Alan Aragon and Paul Carter actually at a, at a Armbrust Pro Gym. And Dylan invited us, and I was dieting down for a show. I think I was one or two months out. And I trained that day. He invited us over and cooked some great steaks, you know. And I want to, of course, come over. But for me, especially where I was, having carbs for that workout, because I think I'd, I think I'd gone several days without them because I wasn't training because of seminar, whatever it was, it was sort of like kind of an important meal. I didn't mind whatsoever. I brought over, I think, a box of Lucky Charms and I ate those. And these guys are, everyone there is a bodybuilder, you know? So it, like, but still I, you know, I went with the strategy that I knew and I didn't have the steak, which looked like it was really good. And I, it's not that I don't like steak. Alan, of course, it was like, how do, I don't even know how you do that. Like, what do you, how can you pass up this steak? I'm like, dude, right now, everything tastes great. Like this, these Lucky <laughs> Charms are really good. Trust me, whatever I had, I can't remember what it was. So, but that strategy you're talking about lends itself well to having more normalcy, you know, which I think is a huge thing for so many people. They, they dive so deep in and they get into that mode of, you know, the warrior mode of suffering and they sort of neglect their personal relationships and they don't go out and have dinner with a significant other or dinner with friends and a mixed macronutrient meal means that you could go and you could even say, you know, we're going to go to restaurant X and I'm going to have like, you know, the the shrimp meal that's got a fatty sauce on it or whatever it might be. And you could do that. And that's part of your, that's part of your very intentional strategy. It's not like I'm falling off the wagon and just eating just whatever I want on this day. You're doing it for the, the reasons maybe you're just, you know, using this for a justification, but who knows? I think generally speaking, it's better to have that as an option. I think just for living a little bit more normal, especially if it makes sense and, and works better for you and, for the reasons that I was just talking about. So I like that idea a good bit. Yeah, it's just, it, it's so interesting because, you know, whenever someone's structuring their refeed, right? Like 
the most common thing you hear is that like nothing else changes, right? Like you just get an extra bolus of carbohydrates on your day. And, you know, if there's the potential to improve your physique while also getting to be uh, a real person going out and about doing regular person things when you're, you know, pretty close to a show, I, I think that could be a huge game changer for a lot of people, you know, and, it, and it's, definitely seems like it's something worth experimenting with uh based on the science that it can you know have a positive effect on your physique yeah, you'd really want to be in a situation i think where that those intramuscular triglyceride stores are low um i mean the, the high carb thing that's a safe bet like you tell you give someone you got two meals even if it's 500 grams of carbs <clears throat> you'd be very unlikely to store that as as body fat assuming you know you, you're doing things right and you're in a overall deficit over the course of the week so so it's a bit of a bit of a gamble and it would i think the extent to which you shift those fats and carbohydrates during those refeed meals would be a function of how your diet's been up until that time so you know if it were higher in carbon lower in fat you might expect that it makes sense to refuel those fat stores especially if that's the strategy you've used so i mean heck like this is going to sound like we're coming from an alternate universe you know but Imagine where someone was eating hardly any fats, maybe just using fish oil, and their refeed is a fatty one. Like literally, you know, they've got carbs and their carb levels are pretty good, you know, probably somewhat low from the training, but for them, the refeed would be like a keto, like would be ketogenic meals to some degree with a little bit of carbs just to top over those stores because they've stayed relatively high, whereas the triglyceride levels are lower. So, but all that's still kind of guesswork. We don't know, like, said in the animal work, it's all over the place in terms of the relative percentage of, of volume, what the stores are. And so more just like, literally, this is, it's kind of a brand new kind of frontier. That's, it's interesting. It's so neglected um, by, uh, by exercise physiologists, uh, just because, you know, carbohydrate is just kind of historically. And I think as far as funding, that sort of thing, it's just been so highly studied. Uh, people just kind of forget that it's the forgiven fat, forgiven, the forgotten fats, you know, that now, especially with ketogenic diets being so, um, so prevalent, I think there's going to have to be some money for this if people really want to want to dig on it, because it just makes sense. There's just so much there. So yeah, I, I like can, the idea. I can see why you compete so often. There's just <laughs> so many, there's so much potential for experimentation. There's so many variables that you can play with. And then on top of that, as we know, right, like every contest preps a little bit different, like the body just responds a little bit differently. And then like mm -hmm. when we throw <laughs> all of these variables into the box, right. It's like, you know, can you ever nail your peak? Right. And it's like, you right. like a nine out of 10 peak is like fantastic. But like, did, mm -hmm. did you ever, did you ever get the 10 out of 10? And it's like, I, I don't know if you can get it right. And it's like, yeah. Well, all of my data from like these past five years of competing shows this. And then it's like, so maybe based on this, I should tweak it this time. And it's just like, nope, you responded completely differently this prep. So like we need a new strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, the, there, there's the, the 10 is a moving target too, mm -hmm. as you said, because every prep's different. So, you know, what would have been a 10 maybe a previously isn't a 10 now because, you know, the look that you got didn't represent how good you could have looked because you actually made improvements in your physique or what have you, you know, or you, maybe you get a 10 for that physique because you declined over the years, you know, and you, you really nailed it. Your peak week was great, for instance, but you don't have the physique you had a decade before that. So, so yeah, it's a, just a continuous thing is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a um, test of your patience and it's helped so much with my perspective, just kind of accepting as things are, you know, enjoy that, enjoy that puzzle and know it's unsolvable at the same time. So, you know, that's kind of the, kind of the fun part about it. Like, you know, life's a mystery. So I, I think the last thing I want to get to is carb loading and mm. potential differences in the amount of time you devote a, you devote to carbohydrates. Right. Mm. So mm. in some people who, you know, they require a ton of carbohydrates to fill out their physique. I think just, on the surface that might make it more uh, efficient to spread it out over, over a few days in, in order to fill everything out. Um, but I'm curious about your thoughts on whether the number of days you space 
the carbs out matters if carbs are equal. Right. So it's like, okay, we need, we need like a thousand carbs to fill out this physique. Right. Like what, would it, would it matter if we did that in two or three days compared to one? So like, from what I'm familiar with, and I'm sure you're aware of this as well, like Cliff Wilson's really popular for the rapid backload. Right. So in some of his clients, he would do that all in one day. And to me, that that just sounds so risky, right? Because when you're in this depleted state, like we we have to consider these other changes that are going on too, right? So if if you Mm. haven't been having that much carbohydrate, you know, the past month, like there are some down regulations in in the enzymes that help with that metabolism of carbohydrate. So if, if those are down regulated and then you're not used to having a large volume of food, perhaps gut discomfort is enhanced w- with this huge loading. So to That's me, I'm a big issue. Yeah. So to me, you know, I hear these strategies. I'm like, it, it's, I don't even think it's, it, it's worth the risk, but maybe you can fill me in to where uh, it might actually make sense to put all of those carbs in, in one day to optimize appearance compared to just uh, two or three days. What, what are your thoughts there? Oh, so there's, mo- there's multiple kind of things to consider. So different scenarios, like one, there's one scenario we address this too, and the, in the individual has to make weight. So they may have no choice if they mm-hmm. want to fill out, they've got, they've got to weigh in. And it could be on a Friday, you know, and they're going to compete the next day. So you hear the stories, you know, guys are up all night long, you know, eating whatever they can get a, their hands on, but you're right. The GI is just not going to handle. I think some of it's microbiome, you know, um, you can get really rapid glycogen storage, you know, after you've depleted quite a bit. I haven't, I haven't seen, there's a little bit of data, although I haven't ever experienced this empirically at all, suggesting that you might be somewhat sort of refractory. There might be some insulin resistance that comes with prolonged ketogenic dieting. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're doing repeated refeeds and that sort of thing, and you're, you're, you'll know how to adjust for any of that phenomenon that might be happening. So one of the things is that it's not, um, it's not kind of a simple, you know, Lego block, add the carbs up, you know, you've got your caloric expenditure based on your metabolic rate and what you're doing. And then you just add the carbs on top and those all go in stored. There's some truth to that. But let's say you've got, you need to, you want to store a thousand grams of carbs in the skeletal muscle. Um, there will be a maximal rate, which you can do that. It's kind of tough to exceed that if you've really been glycogen depleted. Um, it will sort of slow down after six to eight hours. You get really rapid phase and then it sort of slows down. But if someone, for instance, spreads that out over three days and there's someone who then becomes much more lively and their neat goes up. And this will tend to tend to happen. They may may need more caloric intake um, in, in order to get that excess thousand grams to be available because now they're using some of that up and moving around and doing things in some way, shape, or form. So um, that would mean, like for instance, instead of if they're if you presume their caloric balance is two thousand calories a day, and you just take one hundred grams of carbs and add that in for one twenty four hour period. If you tried to take 333 grams and add that to a 2000 calorie a day diet, it might take a little more than that um, because there's going to be some thermic effect of the carbohydrate coming in could vary a little bit. And also literally, I mean, if you went so high that you're just superseded the glycogen storage capacity, then it's going to go someplace. You might have some de novo lipogenesis, It's pretty rare and, and minimal, but there could be some, some differences there. I had a client once, um, years ago, maybe about a decade ago or so. And he had told me this and I'm glad this is very important. I always gather as much information. I want them to work, my clients to work with me as much as possible. We're, we're, we're co-piloting the whole, whole show here. And he said, it takes him like five days to fill out. And, and he was right. It literally did. And that was sort of unexplainable with the amount of carbs that he took in. And, and he, you know, wasn't like running around the block all day long or do something like that. He just, that seemed like that was that was the extent to which maybe his metabolism metabolism was reacting. How many carbs per day was he eating for those five days? We had to give him, I'd have to go back and look. It was just about all he could eat. Oh, okay. It it was like three or 4,000 calories extra. Maybe it's over almost five. It was just atrocious. It was just ridiculous. And I didn't believe him at first. I mean, I I had another client who told me once he was a, a, a wrestler previously. And he told me about some of his shitload meals and some of the stuff he's eaten after a show. And I was, and this guy was a, he was a light heavyweight. So he was less than 200 pounds on stage. We went after a show and he started off, we went to the cheesecake factory and he started off with like one of those, the family size 
nachos, cheese things like the, is the mountain, you know, and he ate the whole, that was his, that was his own appetizer, the whole thing. It was probably 8,000 calories. It was just a giant thing of cheese and sauce and stuff. All the, you know, whipped cream, or the sour cream, everything, he ate it all. And he just kept on going. He had like three entrees. It was, I couldn't, I don't imagine how he possibly did it. Maybe his stomach was prolapsed or something, but so there are extreme individuals like that. I've got a couple of friends in here who are competitive eaters. One of them is a good buddy of mine. He and his wife both are. Shout out to the hungry couple, um, to Nick and Miki. So they put down massive amounts of food and they seem to exceed what anyone else can do. They have to balance their, they're not defying laws of thermodynamics, but so some people just are at that extreme um, level to which like when the incoming calories come in, I, some of it's probably activity level and just fidgeting and other aspects of meat. Maybe there's some metabolic revving that happens. There's might be a, you know, for some people, I think too, um, PED using athletes who are, who are using thyroid on top of things, they'll have a really fast thyroid, you know, that's revving anyway. So, you know, the relative impact of elevated thyroid um, medication, this case on carbohydrate metabolism might be more in some people versus others. There's always like so much variability. So there's a bunch of factors where you sort of line up three or four things, the neat, um, you know, maybe the impact on metabolism, uh, thermogen or the, the thermic effect otherwise, and you've got someone who needs 4,000 calories, whereas someone else can get it done with a thousand. So you're spreading that out may just be what some people need. And I think sometimes it's like they pile in the carbs and they just don't store it as, as glycogen as well. You know, maybe their liver has a greater um, storage depot. So it's just the out, the ends of the spectrum of the things. That's what you hear about. You know, like, you know, if you go on Instagram and you, know, you look at, you know, go to just go to find something that pops up those, the stories, you know, that you might like, they're all like just crazy stuff. Like some guy deadlifting a thousand pounds and, you know, there's all these freakazoids physique wise. If my Instagram is basically just bodybuilding. So you're going to hear about those extraordinary examples, you know, of, of someone who had to carve up on, you know, 5,000 calorie, 5,000 grams. I've got a, a friend of mine who um, he he's in, even into his fifties, he would do a shitload in the morning with a full, full size deep dish pizza hut pizza. And he could do that. He'd know like his diet was as strict as it could be. Like chicken and rice, chicken and rice, chicken and rice, chicken and rice, like total orthorexic type, like pure old school bodybuilding eating. And that's how he got it done. And he was absolutely shredded. And then he would take, and then he was somehow could take a paisan, like a pizza, pizza. He would order them. He like, he'd order it the night before and put it in the fridge. So he'd have it. He'd wake up in the morning at six o'clock and eat that before he went on stage. And he looked great. And he wasn't bloated, nothing. That would have destroyed me. Like it would have been, I wouldn't even gotten to stage. I would have been in the bathroom, you know, the whole time. So there's, those things are out there. So it's, so yeah, having enough time, this is what a practice run is good for. You know, you can also like, just as a side note to that, um, if someone does find that uh, they have a good acute sort of filling out effect from a shitload type of meal, um, they can sort of be add a little extra insurance um, for the potential for spilling over by um, not carving up as much during the week and then being really dry. So that the morning of the show, if they want to employ that type of technique or even throughout that day, you can do that. If you really, really dried out people, you can take in, you know, sodium and fat and carbohydrate laden foods throughout the day and not spill as long as your water levels, water intake is very low. So you can sometimes sort of postpone the glycogen loading in a certain way, um, sort of separate things so that you're doing a shitload or, that's what typically has to happen for someone who can't glycogen load early in the week because they need to make weight. So they have to keep their food and or their carbohydrate low before a weigh-in. So, so there's all sorts of scenarios where you'd want to pattern that glycogen um, restoration process, the super, super, compensatory, super compensatory process over one, two, three days or you know, early on a little bit and later on a little bit so you make weight. I've had to do that with people too. You do the practice run and like you literally track the body weight and you say, okay, where were we at weigh-in times? You know, we took in this many grams of carbs. So you, you see that whole pattern in body weight. And then you simply know that, okay, well, if you're two pounds lighter the week of the show and you end up being four pounds over on the practice run, if we did the same things the same, assuming two pounds lighter all the way through that week, 
you're still going to be two pounds over. So we got to hold you back on your carb up so that we get you on a two pounds lighter trajectory than what you're currently on so that you're two pounds lighter than what you would have been on at the time of the show. So you just redirect everything and a good place to redirect body weight is get as many carbs in as you can so that you're not exceeding the, the weigh in limit. And then of course, put those in afterwards. So load as much as you can and still make weight and then do the rest of the loading thereafter. So lots of different ways that the cat may have to be skinned depending on the circumstances.